The following episode includes a brief mention of sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Imagine being a little girl growing up in Southern California with a world-renowned psychic as your godmother, only to find out during your childhood that you too share a similar gift. That's exactly what happened to today's guest. In this episode, you'll hear her story of self-discovery And you'll learn how to tap into your own intuition and build stronger boundaries within yourself that can help create a more aligned, intentional life. I'm Jackie McDougall, and this is the Grown-Ass Woman's Guide. Dina Padawano is an accomplished intuitive consultant who has been honing her craft for the past 18 years. Her clientele includes celebrities and professionals from various industries from all over the world. Dina's readings involve reading a client's energy, voice, digital pictures, and signature, and her goal is to help her clients gain insight and awareness to enable them to move forward to work on career, relationships, and life vision. Let's start with your story. At one point in your life, uh, were you like throwing out psychic predictions to your friends? When did you know you had a gift? As you know, I have a famous godmother when I was nine would start to notice my ability. And then as I got older, it would be funny whenever I would date guys and I didn't even know like what kind of gift it was. And I would say things are like, are you watching me? Do you follow me? How did you know that? Are you going through my stuff? And I'm like, no, dude, I'm just, (laughs) no, but I'm just super sensitive. Right. And then As I got older, when I moved to L.A. from Orange County, I started doing the metaphysical workshops and meditations that she would have. And she would record me on the phone and she would be like, listen to how negative you talk. And she would make me listen back to I would just die if and I can't stand. So I was trained at a very young age to be very careful about what I say and Mm. how I say it. And then. It wasn't until around like maybe I was 25 or 27, I started putting it into use. And still sometimes till this day, it freaks even me out that I know the stuff that I know. And I I know that we are all psychic. It's just that some of us are a little bit more sensitive or we have honed it better. So I'm at a point now, especially since I've been gluten-free, no alcohol, like the cleaner my body is, the more Mm. intuitive I have become. Interesting. It's really interesting. Like I will tell you, I never used to see spirit or anything before. And I feel it now and I see it now. Or like I could be on the phone with a niece and then I'll be like, do you have a headache? And she'll be like, yeah, I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want you to get it. And I was like, I got it. It's too late. And <laughs> oh, so, so you get the headache? I, yes. Oh. And I will pick up. So I, I've been really good about trying to keep this energy clear. But yeah, I've always been that person who was always empathetic. And so I think empathetic would go hand in hand with intuitive, right? If you're Gen X like me, you may have grown up associating psychics with 900 numbers and Dionne Warwick, but this episode is not that. After spending the first hour recording a private, very insightful, intuitive reading where Dina shared everything from all of the things that have been holding me back, completely accurate, and gave me confirmation that some of the things I want to do are right on track. But most of all, She opened my mind to the idea that we all have intuition. It's just the outside noise that's prevented us from being able to access it. You make a living Uh listening to your intuition, Mm -hmm. but we all could be tuning in more deeply into our intuition. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think the only difference between me and somebody else is that Sometimes people are too afraid to listen to their own intuition. Mm. So then they'll come to someone like me for confirmation of their intuition. Right. Right. So a lot of times people have said to me, oh, my God, I was thinking the exact same thing. So you're confirming what I'm saying. So now I get that I should probably do that. And I'm not saying that I don't predict future things, but I think that we were taught as kids that everything we have or we need is outside of us, right? So listen to your pastor, listen to the elder, listen to your teacher. It was never listen to yourself, listen to your intuition, right? Right. Listen to what your body's telling you. So it goes against everything that we were taught. Mm. 
even being touched inappropriately as a kid, it was like, well, I was told to be polite to adults, to not say anything, to not be have a smart mouth, yes. to not. So it's like it feels wrong, but then you're doing the opposite, right? Because right. you're taught different. Right. And what we're all learning now is that God is inside of us and we are all an extension of God. And everything we have, we already need because if God is inside of us and we are an extension of God, right? And Mm -hmm. so that's what I've been learning for myself is that I was never taught that anything that I had was of use to me. It was to service everybody else. Right. You're kind of blowing my mind right now because if you think about it, it was like respect this person, respect that person. It was never respect you. Yep. Never respect. Never respect how you're feeling, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if that feels inappropriate, if that doesn't fit. And it's like, keep your mouth shut and be polite. Right. Absolutely. And so when you mention God, are you, do you consider yourself a religious person? Are we talking about, like, how are we talking about God? Okay. So in 2021, I had had this really incredible awakening. I had a session with this incredible lady and we were talking, I used to believe in God in the sky. And he was, cause I grew up Christian, born again, Christian, seventh day Advent, like you name it, my mom had tried it. Right. So I was very God-fearing, religious-fearing. Then as I got older, I was spiritual, not religious. And now in the last like three years, what I believe God to be is God is the universe. God is a part of us. We are energetically all a collective and it contributes to everything as action and reaction, right? So I no longer believe that it's a man in the sky saying, you're bad, you're going to go to hell. I believe that... It's this energy that we all create and we're all responsible for. Mm, I love that. Right? Yeah. And by the way, that was a huge part of my identity growing up was being Christian and my faith and all of that. And I've had to figure out who I am without that. Mm, Yeah. I grew up Catholic (laughs) where all your actions were basically, do they fall on the good or the bad you know, side well, yeah, of it. And I'm a recovering Catholic <laughs> and I live in Italy and I, I'm sorry, but everything in this country is based on because of the Vatican. Mm. And right. so it's very run by religion. And I, listen, I, I just find sometimes maybe some religions could be like a little organized crime. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave that there. <laughs> so if you're listening, yeah. understand the word, you know, the term God, and this is not necessarily a religious episode, but I do love to discuss spirituality and energy yes. and connection and all of that. Mm-hmm. And so I feel that we're very much on the same page here. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to intuition. Do you think we all have it at the same level as each other. And then it's just the practice of it. So if Becky is listening right now, I don't know why I called you Becky, but maybe your name is Becky, but (laughs) I'm psychic. But if Becky is listening right now, is she equally as intuitive as Stephanie, who's also listening here? I would say yes, in the way of maybe her voice is louder telling her to be quiet. That sounds stupid. That's Mm. ridiculous. That's so depending on what your narrative is, is and how open you were allowed to be with your thoughts and feelings Okay, and what you're feeling. I think it depends on that. And also I'm a neurodivergent person. So with the autism and the ADHD, I'm maybe a little bit more sensitive than most, but we are definitely all intuitive. Yeah. All of us. And I think it is about honing a skill. I mean, think if you you play a sport and you cultivate a practice, you get better and better and better. Right. But there are some people who are more gifted at said sport to begin with. True. Totally true. But I think that our inner voice can speak to us. Forget about doing what I do. But I think if you learn to communicate and have a relationship with your intuition, Mm. it will serve you. And I think it could be really great. I just feel like we've never been taught to do that. Yes. So here's my question. Will you teach us today? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I feel that I'm very intuitive. I mean, when I was in my 20s, we're out having drinks and one of my coworkers had invited a friend who I had never met. And the friend walked in and I said, whoa. I just had a date 
like just pop into my head and I feel like I know your birthday. And she said, if you know my birthday, I will buy all the drinks tonight. And I said, it's February 23rd. She's like, oh, and she slapped down her license and it was February 23rd. See, and that's amazing. And I still remember the date. And it was so wild. And I would have things like my other friend would be also in my 20s, like filling up her Volkswagen Jetta, which I did not drive. And I didn't know how much gas was in her car or whatever it was. She did the, you know, she made it automatic. So it would just stop when it was full. And I would like uh-huh. say the exact number, like $12 and 13 cents. And yeah, I told you I'm old. Um, back when gas was $12 and 13 cents, but it just pop would stop and it would be right there. And so there would be, and it still happens. And it's wild you said about gluten-free and alcohol-free and all of that because I stopped drinking two years ago. Congratulations. Thank you. And I absolutely feel more connected to my intuition. I'll think about a person. There's a person who hasn't liked or commented or, or even been a presence on my Facebook in a long time. And uh-huh. I recently thought, I wonder how she's doing. And boop, it popped up. She liked something. And it was just, I don't know. I just, it's, it's right there. And I love it because it makes me feel like a superhuman, <laughs> you know? Well, and also think if, if you start practicing that, right, you'll start to realize how powerful you really are. So it's like, did you manifest that energy or did she also feel the vibration? Because sometimes when I want certain people to call me, I will literally go, dude, I need you to call me. I need you to call me. I need you to call me. And like 30 minutes later, they call me. And um, so sometimes I just get a little lazy and I'm in my head, right? But it does feel then, but then what will happen is the human in us will then get afraid of being wrong. And so then we won't speak up. Or then Mm. somebody will go, like, if I go to a party or something, people will go, well, tell me something about myself that I doubt now. And it's like, I'm not a party trick, dude. I'm not like doing this for like fun and I don't need to prove myself to you. That is why I stopped using the word psychic. Mm. I use the word intuitive because really, if you think about it, a psychic will tell you, oh, you're going to have a red shiny car and oh, but, and I'm, I'm not saying that I don't do that, but what I believe is it is not fair to crack open somebody's emotions and bring up a bunch of things and tell them a bunch of things, but not give them any tools on where to go with it. Mm. That's why I mixed coaching with intuition, right? Because the fact is, is someone's like, okay, great. Now I have all this information. Now what? Right. Right. And then you're like, okay, go this way. Take this class. Try reaching out to this person. Do that thing. So I think what happens with our inner intuition is sometimes we don't know if that that inner voice is us, the stuff that's happened to us. So we don't know if we can trust it. Right. Right. And so how you start tapping in is fresh in the morning, right in the morning when you wake up. You, I want you to say out loud how you want this day to be, what you want from this day. Mm. So like when I get dressed, I like to send a message to the universe and it's like, what do you see today? A unicorn, Kawain, right? And I'm like, yes, Kawain, here we are. And then that sets my vibration for the day, my intuition for the day, right? And so I will literally start asking myself questions like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And then I'll write down something. I don't fixate on it, but I I see if I am willing to allow myself to trust myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think really, I feel really, it comes down to your intuition and trusting is what kind of relationship do you have with yourself? And I think that your intuition serves you when it's easy and it's fun. But if your life was depending on it or your job was depending on it, you probably wouldn't trust it as much this, because yeah. you want to do something right. Right. You bring up such a good point because we all have intuition. We all mm-hmm. have those little feelings, those gut feelings. Mm-hmm. I have met more women who have experienced a variety of things in their lives, right? That all this outside energy comes in, whether it's a a significant other past or present, family of origin, bosses, where it's kind of crazy when somebody says something negative, 
you could just take that, like wear that, like a, a, like a cloak, right? Somebody could say positive. You need to hear positive. Like, I don't even know how many, there, there's some research on this, but how many times we need to hear something positive for us to actually own it. And you could hear something negative once. And then we're like, oh, that is who I am. That's part of my identity. But for me, and what I see is self-trust is mm-hmm. the challenge. The intuition is not the challenge. It's the self-trust. It's- And the relationship you have with yourself and can you trust yourself because of decisions we've made in the past Yes, and we haven't let ourselves, we haven't always saved ourselves, right? So how trustworthy can I be if I put myself in compromising positions or I lived with a narcissist or I was abused and how would I know? And And that's where I say my trust, I've been in therapy 27 years. I'm still with my therapist. He's 87 and he will never retire. Like it's never happening. Listen, therapy, relationship with yourself and everything is like going to the gym. You always have to stay consistent. You always have to do the workout. You have to do the work. So for me, I Mm. trust myself now I don't trust myself alone in the house with cookies, but (laughs) I do trust myself in ways now emotionally that I'm not a people pleaser enough anymore that I'm willing to sacrifice my happiness for your happiness. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? So if my intuition tells me no, I'm going to trust that I know we're doing what's best for me because I built that trust with myself. A lot of people who haven't built that trust and done the internal work, they'll be like, well, no, you're just saying that because you're being a bitch or you're being that. Because how many times have we said no to family members? And they're like, you're so selfish. You're so this. Mm -hmm. You're so it's never considered. Oh, good for you for taking care of yourself. Right. It's always been thrown back at us. Well, it's only it's good for you for taking care of yourself as long as it doesn't affect me. Totally. The minute your self-preservation impacts my life, then I'm going to call you all the things that try to get you to change your mind. Totally. And so I think it's so important for us to remember that that's all stuff that we've heard and people have thrown at us. And if we were to ask ourselves, if we were to write it down, am I a bitch? Am I this? Am I that? And then we would ask ourselves, is this true? No, I'm not a bitch. I'm one of the nicest people I know. Can I be a bitch? Absolutely. Hmm. But in this moment, no. Right. So my name growing up was the holiday ditcher because I don't like big groups of chaos and people. Mm. And it turns out now it's the neurodivergence. Right. So I would always offer to work. I worked at Coco's as a hostess. I would always offer to work during Thanksgiving or like Christmas. And then when I was up in L.A., I would volunteer to work those days Mm -hmm. because I couldn't trust them. And so was it my intuition? I was too chicken to say no. So then I made an excuse. Yeah. Right. But now I'm okay enough with saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't come. Thank you for the invitation. But why? But I'm just sorry, I can't come. And that's been one is that I'm trusting my no without justifying my no. Right. Right. And so, cause I've justified for so long to so many because people are looking for loopholes. Hmm. They want to, well, can't you come after? Well, can't you come before? Well, can't you come in between? And no, no is a complete sentence, right? And so what I'm trusting is I deal with a lot of medical stuff, right? And when doctors gaslight me and tell me I don't have something when I've gotten tests, I have the proof. I, I just know for me, that's where I shut down and I'm done with that particular doctor. I'll finish out the meeting and then I, I regroup. And then I go in and I go someplace else. But before I used to believe what they said, did what they said, and didn't trust my own body and my own intuition and my own gut. I'm living this stuff, but you're telling me it's impossible that I have pain here because you don't see anything somewhere. Well, you're telling me not to trust myself, but to trust you. Everything we do is taught to not trust ourselves. Mm. I want to sit with that for a second. Say that again. Everything we do, we are taught to not trust ourselves. Yeah. When you go to the doctor, they tell you what to do. They give you a prescription for your body, for you. Mm -hmm. Every time I try to talk to, I even write, I type that stuff out in two different languages when I go to the doctors here. Do you know how many refuse to read it? It's this crazy thing. And I get it. I went to school. I'm the professional. Yes, but you're not in my body. Right. Where else do you see that? 
telling people about the things that happened to me as a kid of the inappropriate touching of father's friends or this and that. No, there's no way. But well, wait, so because you don't see it, it means it didn't happen. Mm. What happened to, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Because no one wants to have to take responsibility of the guilt or the blame. I wasn't guilting or blaming anyone. I was right. trying to share, but everyone automatically will yeah. deny or whatever because they don't want to take that on, right? Yeah. Or think about when you're with friends who really care about you or family and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to start this new project. And they'll be like, that costs a lot of money. You know that that takes so much time. You know, da, 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 da. So it's like, wait, don't trust all of the things. And by the way, I'm not talking about the people who start something new every other week or whatever. I'm talking about it's taken a lot of time to muster up the strength, right? And to have confidence enough in yourself. And then you show up to the people you love the most and they think that they're helping you by telling you, right? When I used to wait on tables and pursue acting every time, it never failed. So what do you do? I'm pursuing acting. You know how tough that is. You know that's so hard. And I used to go, but can't you say, it's so amazing that you have the courage to do something that I don't. Right. And then they would just sort of shut up. But it's just like, wait, so do we think we're doing someone a favor by warning them of all the fears that we have through our filter, right. through our stuff? Because you know you've met a lot of people who were like, yeah, I went to LA and my fourth day there, I got something. So it's not true for everyone all the time. Right. But if you believe and someone tells you enough how far it is, I mean, let's talk about weight. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Don't trust this. Don't trust that. Don't, you have to do this kind of work at because everybody's trying to sell something. Of course. Because fear, I mean, the family stuff, I get it. They want to keep you safe, right? And 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 yeah. safe to them might mean different things. You're absolutely right in that there's fear. But other people are trying to sell you. And that's what one thing I would say is like, stop for a second. And when someone tells you, you need to, there's something about, I don't know if it's being the 11th kid. But when someone says you need to, and then whatever they say, it could be watch this show, read this book, eat this food. I like will not. I will dig my heels in and I'm like, I will never do that thing because you just told me I need to. Because I don't trust other people and their reason for telling me that in my life I need to do something. Yes. And I'm totally with you there because let's be realistic. I am 54 now, and I've listened to a lot of what a lot of those other people said. Do you know how far behind I used to feel like I was, or I didn't get momentum because I sat in fear with them? Yeah. Or I sat in, yeah, they're right. You know what? Or like my ex, he was, it's just an Italian way. Even if I wanted to go to the market, well, don't go now because it's crowded. Wait until after lunch. And I'm like, dude, but I want to go now. Like, what? Like, why does there have to be a whole story? And it, <laughs> I felt suffocated. Like, mm. I just felt like, and then finally, I just gave in because I was tired of always arguing with it. And then I sat there for nine years and listening to everything he said and having that be my narrative. And not everyone in your family is going to have the same moral compass as you do. Yeah. Not everyone in your family is willing to do the work that you are. They're seeing it through their filter. So they may mean well, but no one's living in your head with you. Right. That is why we have to trust ourselves. Yes. So step number one, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> to really leaning into your own intuition is maybe mm -hmm. understanding and this might require a lot of work in itself, but understanding the motives or the experience of those who are trying to enforce their own views on you. Exactly. So whether it's like confirmation bias. Yes. So whether it's your spouse or your, like I said, your family of origin, your friends, whoever. So like if somebody's saying, don't become a professional intuitive who works with clients and betters people's lives, like no, no, no. People might think this or whatever. Pay attention to what they're saying. Don't follow what they're saying, but try to understand where they might be coming from. Is that is that a good first step? Yes. And then also you can add on to that is it's so nice that they love me so much and they're worried about me, but I'm going to do what I need to do for me anyway. Yes. 
Because you have to add that dialogue in there for yourself. Like you'll be talking to yourself a lot in the beginning about going, oh, shut up. There's no way. No, seriously, you need to do that. No, don't do that. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like I, I literally sometimes will practice with my friend on my podcast, my partner. And sometimes I'll try to, with my intuitiveness, see what she's wearing. And a lot of times we show up in the same shirt. She's like, you're such a jerk. Like, why do you do that? But I just like practicing with little things to start to trust that I know what I'm talking about. Right. So I'm gentle to myself. I show up for myself. So I make it playful or I, I make it simple. It doesn't have to be so hard, but how do you know what is your intuition and what is your narrative? Mm. They're very different things. Your narrative is going to fear. It's like fear mongering. You can't. Yeah, but blah, blah, blah. Your intuition is yes. And, and we can try it. And I got you and don't turn left here, go right here because whatever's going to like, start to ask yourself that, not my narrative or is that my intuition and start being playful. It doesn't have to be something that you have to work at. And another thing that you have to do, I think we will all benefit from having a better relationship with ourselves. Yeah. And I love that. I love the idea of starting small. I, I, for some reason, the Costco parking lot just popped into my brain, right? My husband will say, which aisle? Because I often will use my intuition and I'm like down here and he's like, boom, there's a spot. But I could also sometimes hear the narrative where it's like, oh, it's too crowded today. We're never going to find a spot. There you go. Making sure I sort of tap back in. Yeah. So visualize perfect parking is the, the how I very first learned is like just visualize perfect parking. Wherever I go, parking will be there. So my ex, I kid you not, this is so funny. He used to call me on the phone and he would be in a park. Can you visualize me perfect parking? <laughs> I go, dude. I'm not the one in the car with you. You have to do it. Yeah, but I don't know how. Mm. And, but do you see the unwillingness to do the emotional work? Oh, and we could have a whole episode about the emotional labor that is put on totally. women, but that's a whole other topic. No, totally. <laughs> but I'm just saying is he started believe. Oh, and then the Mercury and retrograde, like he would then start quoting Mercury retrograde because he didn't believe me at first with all the woo-woo. And then when he saw me put everything into effect, then he started becoming a believer. Mm. Then he started showing up and getting curious. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So be the example. And if people go, you're crazy, say, thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like, and grow with, grow with you so great. Thank you so much. It's the best compliment ever. <laughs> right? Because to some people, it seems crazy that you're willing to jump off whatever ledge because their narrative tells them that they can't. Mm. Yes. That's why I stopped announcing things to people. Mm. Because they have opinions. Well, and then I would realize that their opinions would dilute and contaminate my intuition. And then I would make it a narrative. Mm. So I would have all of this hype. And then I was looking for confirmation bias. And then you go to the wrong person. They're like, are you nuts? And you're like, oh my God, it didn't even occur to me, am I? Instead of going, no, I'm not, blah, 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 right. right? And so what I've learned is I, a lot of times will tell people after. Yeah. And that's a good point too. Who are you going to for your confirmation bias? How many times do people do that where they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go tell this person about this exciting thing. And then that person has all these like, well, what about this and this and this? And you're like, why did I go to you? And now you're deflated. Totally. And what I've done now is I go, why are you calling this person? You know that they've never showed up in the last 755 times you called, but there's always that hope that this call, oh, they might be different yeah. and that they might show up in a different way mm -hmm. and then you get destroyed. So I'm learning now to hang up the phone yeah. and I'm learning now to do all of that. But before I thought that I had to hang on to that every word and that word was you know, like for me, finding out later in life that I have autism was I'm a literal thinker. So if someone told me something as a kid, I literally thought that that was truth. Mm. Right. And so now I'm relearning a lot of different things, emotions and all of that. So I use my intuition too when I'm on the street, like you practice and practice when you go into a room of the vibe you get. 
like, you know, when you go into a room, they're either not your people or they're your people. You're like, oh, this seems cool. This seems not cool. Right. So start trusting that instead of pushing through thinking it's your own anxiety and you have to work through it to be okay in that. So good. You see? Yes. Oh my gosh. So I have to tell you, when I changed the branding of my podcast from, for, it was formerly 40 Thrive to the Grown Ass Woman's Guide, it was the best thing I'd ever done because even though I may have lost some listeners, when I tell someone, oh, I'm the host of the Grown Ass Woman's Guide, I either see them lean in for more information or they're out and they're physically, like I could see them physically. And it just like, yeah. it declutters my space and my energy so quickly because I know, and it's not that I don't want to talk to people who don't care about my podcast. It's not like I'm walking around parties, like, but it's so nice to know that somebody who might not be aligned with who I am and what I believe and what I stand for, they kind of like just melt away a, a little bit. Yeah. And you don't have to try to convince them or recruit them of what you're doing yeah. is right for you or for yeah. them. It's the name you're getting for me. You're aligned. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I think we all need to start doing, right? Mm. Is that so I live in a country where it is not normal to greet people in the morning to be like, good morning, good morning. People will literally take their sunglasses and go, do I know you? And I'm like, nope, just good morning. And then I thought to myself, well, do I change to accommodate the country or do I just keep being myself and my right people will show up? Mm. And so we know I have not changed myself and I use my dogs a lot to be like, good morning. And I'll say it even louder and more obnoxious because the people who get it, get it. Mm -hmm. And the people who don't, don't. Right. And like you said, it weeds it out quicker and I don't want to waste my time. And I've also lately, I'm not selling myself to people anymore. Yes. Like I'm not convincing you how good I am and what I bring to the table you either like the exchange or you don't. It's like so many people take your number and never use it. Okay, no, thank you. Closed door, right? Mm. So I'm learning what my closed doors are and my open doors are. And that's also getting older, right? I think that we all kind of understand. But I'm also not willing to give myself away anymore. Yeah. To people who don't even want it. Right. Because right. we do that so. and we try to bend over backwards and into this pretzel formation to somebody who probably isn't going to like us anyway. And sometimes those are people who've been in your life a very long time. Sometimes those are people who are related to you and you feel like you're like, I'm trying to become this person so you'll like. But guess what? Regardless of how hard you try to please them, they're not coming. So be yourself. Please yourself. <laughs> Is show up for yourself. Yes. Be the parent that you never had. I remember in the second grade, my mom saying, what do you want to do when you get older? And I said, I want to be an actress. And her exact words were, you better think of a fucking backup career because that's never going to happen. Uh -huh. I was in the second grade. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, my mom did not have the luxury of having hopes and dreams and a bunch of things. So she was just thinking that she was saving me a future of torture and letdown and disappointment. Right. Right. Yeah. But as that child, I didn't know that. So for a very long part of my life, I tried proving her wrong. So was I really acting, trying to pursue acting because I wanted to, or I wanted to prove her wrong or whatever. And then you always have so many people who are in the, it's really hard. Maybe you should, you know what? Let me just do what I'm doing. Right. And yeah. so as you will see, even doing a podcast or things like that, you see who shows up for you consistently. You mm -hmm. see who's in your corner, who's got your back and who's showing up and praising you and encouraging you. Right. That stuff doesn't go unnoticed. And it's not like I'm counting, but before I was more interested on getting the people who didn't like me to recruit them to like me than to appreciate the people who were already there liking me mm. and support. Oh, yeah. I had a history of if I walked into a room and there were 10 people and nine of them were lovely and one of them didn't like me, I would spend so much time and energy trying to change that one person. And now, I mean, I actually sell T-shirts now that say I'm not for everyone. Like that's, a, that's something I've taught my kids. You are not for everyone. There will be people who don't prefer you 
And it's okay. You don't have to bend over backwards to try to get them to like you. And the shocking thing about that is no one ever told us that we weren't going to be for everyone. It was Mm. so important to have everyone like you. Yeah. So no one was ever saying to me, it's not a big deal that they don't like you. You are who you are. You are the prize. So then I was like, well, shit, now I got to convince them that I'm worth it. Right. And what's wrong with you that everyone doesn't like you? That was more of the messaging, right? And to go back to your point of being a, a child who maybe had some instincts or some intuition, that gut feeling, we were to no fault. People, you know, I, this is not like a, oh, they, these people did this blame session. Most people do the best they can with what they have. Of course. And so we grew up at a certain time, right? <laughs> but it was like, no, 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 we don't create conflict. We avoid it. We sweep it under the rug. We, sh- 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 you know, don't notice, don't cause a problem. And now we live in a time where I think <laughs> the pendulum in some ways has like people are burning shit down when they really don't need to yeah. be. But I think there's a way to stand up for yourself and just speak up for yourself and what you believe effectively. You don't have to be louder. You just have to be confident in what your convictions are. And it's okay to ruffle a few feathers in order to protect yourself and those who maybe need your protection. Totally. And then think about it. When you start believing in yourself, there is nothing stopping you. Right. Because you believe what you're saying. You're not trying to convince yourself that you're enough. You're not trying to convince yourself that they should like you. I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And that is okay. No one ever gave me that permission before. Mm Mm-hmm. No one ever gave me the permission that it's okay if not everyone likes you. You're incredible who you are. You live in your own home with your own head, your own family, your own things. And I'm like, wait, what? So it's interesting that I'm in Italy and I feel like I escaped my history, right? Where no one I know from my past life can pop up on me at any time. Mm. And I've been realizing what that's from is I grew up in hustle culture and it was always what are you doing? It's 830 on a Wednesday. You're not going here. You're not already at the gym. You're not already dressed for the day. You're not. And it didn't just happen in my household. It's a culture of like, so who's your agents? How many auditions are you going on? What car do you drive? That gave me such anxiety all the time that me showing up at me was never enough. It was, what was I going to add to prove myself to be enough? Right. And never mind in LA, if you meet a new person, there's this like, oh, well, I'm going to ask you about you because I really want to know what you can do for me. Exactly. And you know, in Italy, that's considered a very rude question. What do you do? Mm. Like uh, cars aren't a big deal here because the robberies and the things. But so I've been very humbled, but also no one's ever commented about my weight here. No one's ever commented about my job here. No one's ever commented about my car. How are you today? What'd you eat for lunch? Oh, the weather's amazing. Oh, you look so beautiful. Oh, how are the dogs? Like, it's just all very polite. Now, I'm not saying the country's perfect, but I am saying being culturally different, Mm. it was such a relief. And I'll tell you, such a relief to the first 10 years that I lived here, I gained 60 pounds because it was for the first time in my life that it wasn't constantly, what are you doing? Diet, 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 diet. And it was first time. And thankfully now I've released it, but I didn't realize what an impact every day about my physical appearance had on me. Yeah. Right. And so now I find that I'm recovering from all of that. Right. I'm like coming out of PTSD from like childhood, just surviving like everything. And these last couple of years, I've been able to sort of get it all out, show up for myself and see what that looks like. Mm, I love that. And yeah, and it's not everyone has the luxury all the time, but I live a very simple, low demand lifestyle because I deal with a lot of physical stuff. But I had to do that in order to get to know who I am. Because I will get distracted and then offer to go cook dinner for 10 people and then my back will kill and then I'll go offer to make Halloween decorations. I'm not, no, no, no. It's now you got to focus on you Mm -hmm. because before I service everybody else. Yeah. 
And look where that got me. I'm 34 surgeries, four autoimmunes. Like it comes with the price tag. Right. Was it because of your health or how were you able to release that need to please everyone else? It was living with my ex and continually crying and being distraught that he didn't think I was worth changing for. Right. And then, of course, with therapy and then studying lots of things, I'm not going to diagnose him. But then finding out the way my brain works. And then it wasn't until I stopped drinking that did I find out that I knew I had ADHD, but I didn't know everything it entailed. But then when I studied my brain and then the autism, the way everything works, I realized that, wait a minute. I'm not depressed and I'm not this. I'm just autistic or I just have ADHD. So let me figure out how to hack it and how to work it in that direction and see if that fits me. So I changed my whole kitchen around. I changed everything around Mm. because I'm someone out of sight, out of mind, right? So now I have a shelf in my kitchen. Everything's in glass jars. So when I go there, I can look and I can assess and I can do. And so- What I started realizing is that when no one was around was when I was getting rest and I didn't have those thoughts of myself. It was that when people were around telling me who I was, because I didn't really know who I was, I believed them. Hmm. And then I started showing myself who I am. And then sometimes I'll see parts of me and I'll go, when I started releasing more weight, I was like, I remember you. Hey, girl, it's been a while. (laughs) Like, you know, the thinner, the childlike part of yourself or a friend called me who I was friends with when we were in our 20s. And she goes, oh, my God, I can't believe you live in Italy. Do you remember when you were 20? All you ever said was, I'm moving to Italy. I'm moving to Italy. I go, I did. And there I was 21 years later, I moved to Italy. But I forget parts of myself that had dreams and hopes and things I let men and bosses and the industry or whatever crush all of that. Yeah. And then I became everything that I thought I was supposed to be to be good enough for that. Right. But you take all that away and you're just stuck with yourself. You have no other choice but to look at yourself. You're absolutely right. I remember when I was in my 20s, it was like, I'll make six figures before 30 and I'll buy a house. And I, and I would like find the love of my life. Check, 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 check. And I would have all these check marks, right? They were all, they all happened because I had a map a little bit. And I think what's really important for me now at 52 is having that map or those, those goals. And also understanding that not everything is in your control. Like Jackie in my twenties was like, okay, are these the things I want? This is how it happens. And that, that part is the tricky part, right? And so one of the things you said in my reading just a little while ago, you talked about really knowing where I want to go. And I think, Mm -hmm. like I said, in my 20s, I was like, this is where I want to go. This is how I get there. And then after maybe in my 50s, I'm like, well, things happen in a different way than what you expect. So I'm just going to hand it all off to the universe or to however the chips may fall. I think there's maybe what I'm learning from you today, and you can jump in and correct me if there's a correction here, but we need to have those goals. We need to still create yes. the arrow, right? These are the places, the map, the map where I want to go. Yes. And then be open to it happening. In creative solutions. Yes. In its own way. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, because the adult in us And the realist in us and the reality checker will be like, well, you know, it's going to cost this much and you may not be able to do that. No, no, no. You're fucking with the dream side. Like, leave that part up to the universe. Like, that is none of your business. State your intentions. And of course, if you want to be a millionaire and you don't play the lotto and you're not hiring your education and you're not having a job, well, that's just ridiculous, right? But I'm saying for those of us who are doing the work, who are mapping things out, who are doing things, it's so important for you to literally give instructions to your manual of like, okay, and that's why we put a date on it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't put a date on it, universe is like open-ended, Right here we go. No, we're going to, I have a friend who sometimes want to knock her out, but she literally (laughs) will go, I don't believe in calories. Wayne Dyer said that I'm eating ice cream, but ooh, it's no calories and it's so good. She never gains weight. 
It always works for her. Is it annoying? <laughs> yes. But she will state things and put things out there. And sometimes you just want to, but it always works. So you can't argue with her. Yeah. It always works out for her. And she totally trusts the universe. I'm not saying everyone has to be that way. Her direction and the way she gets it works for her. Right. Right. I'm somebody who I like to put things into motion. Right. And so sure, I'll help the universe out. But I'll tell you when something and it might be a little off topic, but I think it kind of comes down to this is that are you living an honest life? And what that means is, you know, like, oh, I've been really watching my eating and I've been really blah, blah, blah. And I don't know why I'm not losing weight. Well, okay, let's write down every, and by the way, my therapist did this to mm. me. Let's write down every single thing you're eating. And then you write it down and then he goes, go get the packages. I go get the packages. We look through and we found hidden sugars and we found hidden carbs and we found hidden things that in my mind, but I know better enough that I should have been reading the labels and I wasn't. Mm. So I was trying to, you know, take shortcuts. Yeah. And I was trying to do it the easy way. And I adapted a narrative that suited my victim mode. Mm. Right. But what I am saying is if you're ready to be honest and you're ready to start manifesting and getting the things that you really want, are you honestly willing to do the work? And I always say to people, success is preparation and being ready. There are a lot of creative women out there, especially who listen to this, who do all this creative, incredible work. Everyone's looking for that next client, right? Everyone's looking for the next speaking gig. Like, do you have that speech? If you're someone who wants to be a speaker, do you have the speech ready so that when somebody says, oh my gosh, we just had a cancellation, can you hop in there? So it's about being intentional. We think we're showing up. We think we're doing all the right things. And then we do get into victim mode of why isn't this happening for me? And it's like, mm -hmm. are you really doing the thing to support yourself? Are you really showing up? I talk about this all the time. If you've listened to the show before, you've heard me. So manifesting, you know, there are people who are like, okay, let's going to manifest all the things, right? I'm going to manifest a new job. But if you don't go out and apply for jobs exactly, or go to networking events or whatever, nothing's going to happen. And you got to be very specific about the job. Mm. I want a job that pays me a certain amount after taxes. I want coworkers that I get along with. I want it to be close to my house. I want to have a parking space. I want to, you, you got to be very, very specific. Right. In my vision board, I had Italy. It never occurred to me. It was like a bridge out of a wedding book. And it was the bridge that goes from outside of Rome into Vatican City, right? But I forgot to say I want my husband to be romantic or kind or like all I got all the Italian way. I got all that right. Yeah. But I, I forgot the rest of the stuff. <laughs> right. And so I think intentional is really important, meaning I want to do something that I'm proud of that makes me happy, that gives me growth, that, you know, it has longevity. Dina is available for private readings and coaching from the comfort of your own home. And if you're a Grown Ass Woman's Guide listener, which clearly you are, you get $30 off your first reading or coaching session when you mention this episode. Dina is as passionate as I am about helping women access the tools we need to live as our absolute best selves. In fact, if there's only one thing you take away from this episode, it's this. What do you want a woman who listens today to walk away knowing or feeling? That she is enough, no matter what she has to offer physically, sexually, anything that if you look down deep and you know who you are, you have everything you need. You are enough. I just think that everyone needs to understand we are going through unprecedented times right now and it is okay to feel heavy. It is okay to feel scared. But don't do it alone. Don't isolate yourself. Show up with trusted friends and trusted people. That's how we get through this together. That's how we cultivate friendships. That's how we start showing up for each other is we start trusting in each other and showing up for each other to support each other, to say, you got this and I'm behind you and I will catch you if you fall and I will rise you even higher when you rise. Thank you so much for listening. For more information, links to related episodes, and a transcript of this episode, visit grownasswoman.guide forward slash episode 196. And let's connect on social at grownasswoman.guide. Until next time, you are a grown ass woman.
act accordingly. The Grown Ass Woman's Guide is produced by Grown Ass Creative, a media and marketing agency powered by Grown Ass Women Over 40. Spring has sprung, and with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconut. Coconut is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments, with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.